Today we're going to talk about common digestive problems. The first one is choking. And the official definition is food lodged in the trachea, which cuts off air. And I'm pretty sure you all know how to solve, some, solve the problem of someone choking, and that's the Heimlich maneuver. Um, the top of the windpipe, or the trachea, and the top of the esophagus, the openings are very close together. And when all systems don't work um, in concert together, you can possibly swallow food and have it go down the windpipe instead of the esophagus. It's especially worrisome and risky with children um, because sometimes they don't chew food entirely or they eat too fast. Um, especially concerning for children is um, hot dogs. If you think about it, um, they're a perfectly round shape. If um, the child took a bite from the hot dog, maybe without a bun, and s didn't chew it properly and they'd swallowed it, it could be just the right size and shape to plug the windpipe. Uh, grapes are sometimes a concern. Marshmallows, nuts, and so it's actually recommended when you're feeding little kids those foods that you cut them in half lengthwise, the hot dogs, the grapes, the marshmallows, so that they don't swallow that, um, that potential shape that could act as a plug and cause choking. Also, it's good to know, I suppose, that um, I've been told by the EMT folks that if someone is able to speak and say, I'm not choking, <laughs> they're not choking, or if they're able to speak at all. So you shouldn't Heimlich someone that um, is able to speak to you because they're not truly choking. Uh, vomiting, I'm assuming you're all familiar. Um, a, the official definition is expulsion of stomach contents through the esophagus to the mouth can happen for all kinds of reasons. It can happen with foodborne illness. It can happen with um, ingesting too much alcohol. It can happen with other kinds of illness. It can also happen with nervousness. People can, um, the nervous system is very closely tied to the digestive system, and someone can actually um, throw up if they're too nervous or upset about something. Diarrhea is next. Officially, a frequent passage of watery bowel movements and it's generally when the intestinal contents are moving too quickly. And again, I'm assuming everyone has experienced this at some point. Again, it, the causes can be so wide-ranging, so many different reasons why someone would have diarrhea. One particular food that they ate that didn't settle well with them, um, an intestinal, a bacterial infection, um, intestinal diseases like Crohn's disease or um, colitis, nervousness, all kinds of things. Uh, constipation which would sort of be the opposite of diarrhea, officially um, infrequent or difficult bowel movements. And it may not seem like that serious of a thing, constipation, but actually the, in the United States we spend a great deal of money on laxatives because so many of us are constipated and we can't get um, the waste eliminated in a pain-free or frequent enough manner. Belching. Uh, officially, the definition is expulsion of gas from the stomach, and I wouldn't necessarily call that a common digestive problem. It's pretty normal to have belching. Um, when it is leaving the body from the other end of the GI tract, it's called gas or flatulence. And again, certain things that we eat can make that worse, and some things can make it better. Uh, heartburn or something very similar. GERD. So heartburn is a backflow of stomach acid into the esophagus. And GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it's generally given that name when it's severe. Um, occasionally people have heartburn maybe once every three or four months. But if it's a daily or a weekly or a monthly thing, it's more serious than it's often called GERD. Um, ulcers. The definition is an erosion of the top layer of cells from an area such as the wall of the stomach or the duodenum. You can also have um, pressure ulcers or bed sores if someone stays in, in bed too long and doesn't get up and move around, then they can actually erode the top layer of cells from uh, part of their body, like an elbow or a heel. But in this case, we're talking about ulcers in the digestive system, um, which are often in the first part of the small intestine or the stomach. Back in the day... We used to think that ulcers were caused by stress 
and spicy food, or at least we knew that they made them worse. And so the the treatment back in the day was to put someone on a bland diet, no spicy foods, no black pepper, sometimes no caffeine, no alcohol, um, and tell them to find some way to manage their stress. But interestingly, a few years back, uh, research was doing a study of something else and happened to accidentally discover that many of the people in his study that had ulcers were also testing positive for a bacterial infection called H. pylori. So now there's a test for H. pylori. So if someone has an ulcer, they can test them. And if they test positive, then the treatment for ulcers now, some ulcers, is actually an antibiotic, which is strange considering what we used to think caused it and what we used to do to treat it. And now we treat many ulcers with antibiotics. Diverticulosis is sacs or pouches that develop in weak areas of the intestinal walls. So let me try and draw a little picture here. So normally the intestine, small intestine, would look like this. But if someone has diverticulosis, they have these little pouches. Now, the presence of the pouches is called diverticulosis, and it's generally not troublesome. However, someone can get diverticulitis, which is when something gets into one of the little pouches and gets inflamed or infected. Then you have diverticulitis. So itis often means inflammation. So if you think about appendicitis, it's when your appendix is inflamed. So in diverticulitis, your diverticula are inflamed. And that's generally when people have pretty severe pain and oftentimes end up in the ER. The treatment is generally, um, in the long term, is a high fiber diet because high fiber seems to reduce the incidence of the pouches. However, while someone's having a flare up, they would not be put on a high fiber diet because it can make it a little bit worse. Um, it's common in the United States and other Western countries, and we think it's possibly related to our overall poor diet, which is generally low in fiber. Um, so the treatment would be maybe dietary long term. Um, sometimes they would do antibiotics if one of these diverticula was infected. But one of the other things they'll do is just a surgical treatment. If it's bad enough, they'll just go in and surgically remove the area that's causing trouble and hook the two ends together, two ends of the pipe together, and the person's fine. And if you remember from looking at the diagram, the small intestine, we have a lot of it. So um, it would be okay to take out a few inches of troublesome and just hook the ends together and the person would uh, be just fine. The next one is irritable bowel syndrome. An irritable bowel syndrome is often called a diagnosis of exclusion, which means that if someone is having GI trouble and they are tested for gluten intolerance and colitis and Crohn's disease and ulcers and colon cancer, and it's none of those things, it's often lumped under the title of irritable bowel syndrome. There's different theories on what's causing it. Um, one is that um, people with IBS are more sensitive to um, stimulants in the diet, whether it be carbonation or an actual stimulant like caffeine or too much fat. And so when a person ingests those things, the GI tract reacts angrily or irritably. Um, some people with IBS are treated with antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs, which seems to calm the nervous system part of the, what the, nerv the, part the nervous system plays or possibly plays in IBS. Um, it's estimated that it's responsible, IBS is responsible for more missed days of work in the United States than the common cold. So it's fairly significant. It's often classified as diarrhea predominant, constipation predominant, or alternating diarrhea and constipation. And then the last one I'm going to put over here, because I didn't leave myself enough room, and that is celiac disease. Celiac disease um, is present when someone is unable to digest gluten. Gluten is the protein in wheat, rye, and barley. And 
if someone has gluten intolerance and in, they ingest gluten, then the villi and the microvilli, which are responsible for absorbing nutrients, don't act the way that they should, and so it causes GI symptoms like diarrhea or bloating, um, but it also causes malabsorption of some pretty key nutrients um, like iron and calcium and other things. So it can be pretty devastating nutritionally. What's interesting about it is it's considered fairly um, low prevalence, maybe half to 1% of the population. The treatment, the only treatment, there's no medication treatment, there's no surgical treatment, the only treatment we have is dietary, and that is to follow a completely gluten-free diet. Not a low-gluten diet, like I try and not eat a lot of gluten, but I have a little bit. A gluten-free diet, absolutely zero. And in most people that have celiac disease, they have a pretty miraculous response once they take gluten out of their diet in terms of their daily GI symptoms. The example that I find fascinating is Elizabeth Hasselbeck, who I understand is married to a famous football player. But back in the day, she was one of the earlier contestants on Survivor. She had had GI symptoms for a very long time and had never figured out what was going on, went on Survivor and ate what you eat on that show on an island, which was primarily fruit, fish, and rice, and for the first time in her life didn't have any symptoms. And when she came home, she tried to sort that out and talk to her doctor. And if you think about it, or if you know anything about gluten, rice is gluten-free, fruit is gluten-free, and meat and fish are gluten-free for the most part, if they don't have a breading or anything on it, which they certainly didn't on the island. And that's how she found out she had celiac disease, was having this unintended dietary experiment that seemed to work. And then when she came home, she figured out what was going on. So gluten intolerance is a very is present for a very low percentage of the population. However, you probably know that all kinds of people are trying to eat gluten-free, which is okay. It's not going to harm them to eat gluten-free, but there's generally no need for it. There's no research that says that gluten causes weight gain and that you should eat a gluten-free diet to lose weight. There's no other research suggesting that there's anything wrong with gluten in wheat, rye, and barley unless you have gluten intolerance or celiac disease. So that concludes the list of common digestive problems.